Happy Resurrection Sunday, Sanctuary Church. Are you ready to worship the King of Kings, the risen Savior today? Come on, I want you to put your hands together with us. We're going to celebrate that our Savior, our God reigns, He lives, He's alive. Come on, put your hands together with us.
need. Amen. Well, glory to God. Are you grateful to be in the presence of the Lord today? What a wonderful Resurrection Sunday morning we are having here at Sanctuary Church. And we are so glad that you are here today to worship the risen Savior. Amen. And to testify of his goodness and his grace in our lives. If you have your Bibles this morning, let me encourage you in your worship this morning. Reading from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Beginning at verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay and through your faith God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see and verse 6 so be truly glad so be truly glad this morning I hope that would be your your feeling in your heart that you would be truly glad today Glad because you know that Jesus Christ is not in a tomb somewhere in the Middle East, but that he is risen today and alive and seated at the right hand of the Father. Not only that he is risen, but that he has saved your soul, that he has given you victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave, and that you have an eternal inheritance in heaven waiting for you. That should give you gladness in your heart today, amen? That should make you rejoice today. So I want to encourage you to do that this morning as we worship the Lord today. I want you to give all that you have today in worship to the Lord, in gladness for what He has done for each and every one of us, amen? Are you ready to do that this morning? Hey, let's lift our hands to heaven and invite the presence of the Lord to come and be with us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that here in the midst of us you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are risen from the the dead, that you are alive and well. We thank you, God, that you are not only alive, but you are active, active in our lives. And, Lord, that you are moving even in this place today. And so, God, we lift our hands and our hearts and our voices, and we say unto you, God, we worship you. We praise you. We adore you. And Lord, we give to you the best that we have to offer today. And we worship you in all that is within us, God. And we say, be lifted high, the risen Savior. We love you, Lord. Draw all men unto you today, we say. In the name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Amen. Would you give the Lord an ovation? Let's worship the Lord together.
battered body being broken. The public just bore witness to the murder of the man we put our hope in. Our teacher, the Messiah, could it all have been a lie? I've got more questions than I do answers from what I've witnessed with my eyes. Like why, why, why did he have to die? How does an innocent man like him publicly get crucified? What happens now? What do we do? Where do we go from here? Will hope ever be restored or will we forever live in fear? It is finished. Sure, that's what he said, but I'm having trouble understanding that when the so-called Messiah is now dead. The sky was dark that day. The atmosphere had changed. I thought that would be the last time that I would ever hear his name. That was until days later, beaten and bruised, battered body that was broken, suddenly had disappeared. Surely I know you must be joking. But somehow, some way, the stone was rolled aside. The tomb had been vacated with no evidence left inside. That's when I started to realize that I get it now. It all seems to make sense. He took it all up on that cross. Everything for my defense. On that cross, there was my guilt. On that cross, there was my shame. On that cross, there were my mistakes that he dragged into the grave. You see, hope, hope was never lost. In fact, it's truly just been found because that man came, conquered the grave, and turned it all around. Clearly, this was no ordinary man. He was the son of God, just as proclaimed. He suffered pain that was meant for me. His story is forever changed. All done on the account of one specific name, a name powerful enough to break every single chain. That name is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ the Most High. Hallelujah, he is risen. You'll hear all the people cry.
life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore digno de alabar Cristo nombre sin igual digno de alabar digno de alabar
and tell him, declare the worth of the Lord today. He is worthy, worthy to be praised. We honor you today, Lord. We honor you today, God. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the only name by which a man can be saved. We lift you high today, Lord Jesus. We magnify you today. You're worthy of our life. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our adoration. You're worthy of all that we can give you and so much more today, God. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. We glorify you in this place. We testify of your goodness today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the Lord God Almighty today. Praise the Lord God Almighty today. Praise the Lord. The God who is exalted and high and lifted up is the God that is personal as well. God didn't need to come. He was sufficient in and of himself. He didn't have to descend. and He didn't have to clothe himself in flesh and live life on this earth as he did, die on the cross. He didn't have to do any of that. But he did it because he wanted to, to demonstrate to us his love. He wanted to demonstrate that he's a personal God. He wanted to make a way for you and for me to live in a relationship with Him. So this morning, I, I believe that personal God who came and gave Himself for us is the same God who is here to minister to the need that is in your life today. I don't know what you're dealing with in your life. We all come with all kinds of different things, different struggles, different challenges successes, victories, disappointments, dreams, whatever it is that you need from the Lord today, here's what I believe. If you'll come to him in faith, he'll meet you at the point of your need. And he'll minister his grace to your life. You might have heard that word grace at some point in your life and in your journey of faith. Sometimes you think about grace as only his favor, his unmerited favor that is given to us. But let me, let me give you an additional meaning to that word. The grace of God is also the power of God made manifest to you. So when he says, my grace is sufficient for you, that's what the Bible says, that his grace is sufficient for us. It means his power is sufficient in our weakness to meet us at the point of our need and help us. So this morning, whatever you came with, I just want to encourage you. Would you just give it to God? Ask Him to help you with it. And if you ask, believe that He will. And I believe the Lord will meet you right where you are and help you with His grace. Would you pray with me right now? Lord God, we thank You today. We thank You for this atmosphere in which we sense Your presence amongst us. We thank You, Lord, for drawing us close to Yourself. And Lord, we thank you for the promise that we have that if we pray, you will hear us. And if you hear us, you will answer us. And so now in this, in this room, I join my faith together with these brothers and sisters and people from all different backgrounds. And I say, Lord, help us. Would you come now and help us? Lord, whatever it is that they have need of today, would you help us? Lord, if it's encouragement, help us. If it's healing, help us, God. If it's forgiveness, help us, Lord. If it's provision, help us, Lord. Whatever it is, we release our needs to you and we ask you to come now and to do your work amongst us. Touch every life. Lord, every, every person in this room, everybody watching online, God, touch every life right now. Minister your grace in its varied and wondrous forms and touch us today. And Lord, we thank you for doing that. Would you just thank the Lord for meeting your need right now? Lord, we thank you for meeting our need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know,
Because sometimes a prayer doesn't make you feel anything, but it's no less effective. Sometimes you feel like a lightning bolt hits you. Other times you feel like nothing happened. But here's what happened. When you pray in faith, God moves. God moves. And I trust that today God is moving in your life today. Do you believe it? Yeah. One more time, would you give God praise for his goodness today? Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, what a joy, what a joy it is to see you here at our 11 a.m. Easter service here at Sanctuary Church. I'm so glad that you're here today. Uh, if you weren't here earlier in the service or in the or 9 a.m., uh, let me introduce you myself. My name is Clayton Watson. I'm the lead pastor here, and it is always a privilege to extend the ministries of this church to you and to your family. And if you're here for the first time today, we certainly want to get to know you better. And we do that by asking you to fill out the guest card that's in the seat back in front of you. It says, I'm new. If, if you're mortally opposed to pens and paper in this digital age, you can follow the prompts on the screen. And uh, we'll do our best to get to know you better that way. If you would exchange that information at our guest center today, we have a gift for you. We'd like you to have a token of our appreciation for you being here today. Sanctuary family, would you welcome our first-time guest today? Amen. Some of you have already, sit, you have already seated yourself down. I'm going to encourage you to stand back up for about two minutes and tell somebody around you that you're glad to see them today here at Sanctuary Church on Resurrection Sunday. joyful group you are today. Amen. And most of you look better than you normally do, you know. <laughs> oh, I love you so much. So glad to see you here. It's so great to see all of our families gathered together and many of our families here together visiting and everybody dressed up. I've got, I've got some folks wearing ties I didn't even know at, uh, own one, so it's good to see, it's good to see around here. Hey, let me, let me encourage you, if you have your family with you today, or even if, if you just want to uh, memorialize the, the moment, we have a photo opportunity available for you, which is just outside uh, the doors to my right and to your left. Uh, as you go out today, uh, we'd love for you to take advantage of that. Now, it's kind of a bring your own camera kind of thing. So you bring your own camera, and somebody will help you out, I'm sure, but, but uh, we have a photo opportunity out there for you. And as you take advantage of that, let me just encourage you to be Christian today, right? Just be Christian, which means prefer your brother. Don't cut in line. Be patient as you wait. And if you're taking photos, don't take a hundred. Take two or three, right? So the next folks can get in line and uh, have an opportunity to have their family photo for today. But I hope that you'll avail yourself of that and uh, enjoy that here this morning. Uh, some of you have, have uh, asked me this morning uh, about... Lynette, that she's, she's not here, the beautiful Lynette, my wife, you know, but she is unfortunately under the weather today, and uh, she was trying to make it to the 11 a.m. service, wasn't able to do that. She's watching online, and yeah, say hello to her, yeah, say hello, but here's the thing, you know, you're just going indulge, to indulge your pastor for a moment, right? Today is Lynette's birthday, right? So, so she's watching right now. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, on the count of three, I want you to say happy birthday, Pastor Lynette, okay? Can you do that with me? All right, all right. All right, one, two, three. Happy birthday, Pastor Lynette. We love you. Give her, give her a hand. She'll get me later for that. Amen, amen. We love, we love, we love Lynette, and uh, we're so sorry that she wasn't able to be here today. But she sends her greetings to you, and tells you how much that she loves you and appreciates you on this Easter Sunday. 
I want to encourage you this morning as we go to the Lord with our giving uh, today. How many of you know it's important to give, right? It's important to give. There's a, there's a scripture that I oftentimes refer to uh, when it comes to time to give our tithes and offerings, but it's, a, it's especially appropriate on Resurrection Sunday. It comes from John chapter 3, verse 16. Many of you know this verse, but let me, let me just share it with you. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, in that one little verse is encapsulated the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God loved us enough that he came for us, died for us, and that all we have to do is believe in him. And if we'll do that, if we'll give our hearts to him, believe in him, we won't taste the sting of death, but we'll have eternal life, right? Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful message to receive on, on Resurrection Sunday? You know, in that, we understand that God was motivated to give to us because of his love. God is a generous God. His heart is generous toward you and toward me, and, and that generosity is motivated by his love for us. Well, as, as we give back to the Lord, I would that we would be like God, that we would be motivated to be generous by our love for him and our thankfulness for everything that he's done for us. God has been so good to us. You might say, well, you know, this week's been a tough week. This, this decade's been a tough decade. Maybe my life has been a tough God life. Has God been that good to me? Well, yes, he has. If you've got breath to breathe, he's been good to you. If you've, if you've had a moment of life on this earth, he's been good to you. And he is so much better than that. He's given us the opportunity to have eternal life as well. So I want to encourage you to be generous to the Lord today because you love him and because you're grateful for what he's done in your life. Do your very best today to give God the most generous and best offering that you can here on this resurrection day. As you do, the Lord will use that as we minister the gospel to the, of the kingdom to those in our community and around the world. So I would encourage you to give today. If you're prepared to give physically, our usher is going to be coming in just a moment to receive that. If you're not ready to give by cash or check today, you can follow the prompts and give digitally. We'd love, love to make it convenient for you to obey the Lord uh, in your giving today. Our ushers are coming, and just before we pray, let me just say to you, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving each and every week. You make it possible for us to be able to do the work that God has called us to here in Orlando and around the world. Are you ready to give? Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to render back to you a portion of what you've given to us. Everything we have is a, is a result of your generosity to us. So God, I just pray that as we render these tithes and these offerings back to you, Lord, you'd receive them as worship, and Lord, that you would bless both gift and giver today. God, cause these gifts to go far and meet meeting every kingdom need and obligation of this church. And Lord, I pray that you would meet every one of these loving people's needs according to your riches and glory. We give you grace, we give you praise, Lord, for your grace and all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give today. Take a look at this video and, and, and take note of what's coming up here at Sanctuary Church. Good morning, Sanctuary Church, and Happy Easter! We are so glad you have joined us today. My name is Pastor Sarah, and here's what's coming up. There will be no revolution refresh today. All students from 6th to 12th grade can remain in the sanctuary for our Easter service. Did you know that Sanctuary Kids have their own church service every week? Our Sanctuary Kids program starts from ages 3 months all the way to 5th grade, with grade level teaching on the foundations of our faith. These areas include our nursery, junior service, and our kids service. And on Wednesdays, we have Kids Pop, which includes a special themed lesson during our midweek program. But the fun doesn't stop at fifth grade. Sixth through twelfth grade middle and high school students, we have Revolution Students, which offers a full worship service geared towards students happening every Wednesday night, and Revolution Refresh on Sundays following the worship on Sunday mornings. Don't miss out on a single moment of our next-gen ministry opportunities. 
Join us this week for our first Wednesday midweek gathering starting at 6.30 p.m. The Missions Cafe will be open at 5.45 p.m. serving fresh, hot, ready-to-go meals with a family-friendly cost of $5. Both nursery and kids pop will be available and the middle and high school students will sit together in the student section for service this week. It all happens this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. You can meet us here at the sanctuary this coming Saturday at 9 a.m. as we continue to pray first in 2024. If you're learning to pray more, this is a great way to learn. Or if you're a seasoned prayer warrior, this time of prayer is the perfect opportunity to pray with the church. Pray first happens on the first Saturday of every month. Start this April with prayer, this Saturday at 9 a.m. We are so excited for next Sunday. April 7th is Baptism Sunday. If you've recently given your life to Christ or renewed your relationship with Him, this is the perfect opportunity to celebrate that change. Signing up is easy. Just go on the app or online at scorlando.com slash next steps and select the baptism tab. Let's celebrate what God is doing together next week on April 7th in our 10 a.m. Sunday service. And that's all we have for today. Now it's time to continue with the service. So let's open up our hearts, minds, and ears for what God has in store. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever man may say, I see his hand of mercy, and I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always He 
Well, you can be seated if you can this morning. Aren't you grateful for the joy that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ today? Amen. God is so good to us. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful to our worship team. Would you express your appreciation to our band and our worship team? They have worked especially hard this morning uh, with two full services, and uh, we're so grateful for their work. And thankful for all of our volunteers who have served diligently uh, this week in preparation for Easter Sunday. Some showing up really early this morning. And uh, we're so grateful for all of you. We love and appreciate you for all that you do, not only on Easter, but every single uh, week of the year. We're so grateful for helping. Why don't you give our volunteers a, t a hand today? We love them. Well, if you have your Bibles, take them in your hand. Let's make a confession of faith concerning the Word of God. If you're new to the Sanctuary Church, we do this every week just to testify of what we believe about this Bible, all right? So you just say it with me. This is my Bible. It is the indestructible, inspired, and infallible Word of God. I believe what it says. I am who it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. I will gladly receive and obey its truth without offense, and I'll never ever be the same again. Praise the Lord. If you believe it today, give the Lord a hand for his word. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, and then 57 through 66. The word of God says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And picking up at verse 57, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. And going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate or ordered that it be given to him. Joseph then took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. And he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and then he went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite to the tomb. The next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, that the deceiver said that after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And that deception would be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered, and go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Let us pause for prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you today with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the joy that we have felt and the experience that we're having here together. Lord, now as we pause for these next few moments to hear from your word, I pray that you will help us, each and every one, to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and a heart that will receive it. I pray, God, that you will open our minds, and where there is doubt, you will answer questions, and where there is need for clarity, God, you would provide it. I pray that you would draw each and every one of us into a personal encounter with you through your word. I pray, God, that you will help me to speak this word with clarity and conviction in a way that is pleasing to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Amen. Jesus was dead. Not in a trance, not in a trauma-induced coma, not in some long fainting spell caused by a lack of glucose, he was dead. He had been brutally murdered on a cross. 
And as I read here at the very beginning, at just before his death, he gave up his spirit and cried his, sighed his last breath. And when they found that he was dead, they took him off the cross. One of Jesus' followers begged Pilate to be able to give him a proper burial. And Pilate relented and he was laid in a brand new tomb on a cold stone slab. And then a stone was rolled in front of that tomb, sealing what felt like forever the life of Jesus on the earth. Jesus was dead. No mistake about it. No mystery. Dead. When you think about death, death seems fairly final, doesn't it? It's final in this human experience, isn't it? We call it the end of the line. When you come to the end of your journey, the last physical act of physical life is physical death. We travel a journey, an arc of life, naturally, on the earth. We're conceived, we're born, and if we're able to be blessed, we grow and we live and we mature and some of us decay <laughs> a little bit over time. <laughs> And then we die. And that's the end of the story most of the time for us here on this earth. Death is final for the finite. And that was supposed to be the case here in the life of Jesus. It seemed as though the story that had begun with so much promise, the story of a child born to a virgin, the story of a uh, young prophet, rabbi who had wisdom beyond his years and a, a minister who was able to perform miracles and speak with authority the words of truth and reflect upon the scriptures in a way that had never been uttered before. All of this promise was suddenly dashed. It seemed as though this unexpected end had befallen him and now the story was coming to an end. That's certainly what it felt like for his disciples. His disciples had given up a lot to come and follow him. Many of them had given up their livelihoods. Some had walked away from their families. They were, had subjected themselves to all kinds of persecutions. They, they had, had walked away from the some of the traditions of the faith of their upbringing, and they were risking their very lives oftentimes and following after this teacher named Jesus. And now the one whom they thought was the Messiah had hung on a cross and died on a Friday afternoon. And now he was buried in a tomb with a stone rolled across the door. It seemed as though that story was over. It seemed like it was the end of the story for the religious leaders of the day. The Jewish leaders of the day were very threatened by the ministry of Jesus. He was an upstart rabbi teaching a message that they weren't comfortable with, and it was amassing a following, and that following was unseating all of the religious traditions that they had so uh, uh, comfortably ensconced themselves with, and their power was being threatened, and the religious leaders of the day were not at all happy about it. And when Jesus was on that cross and he died his last breath, they said, thankfully... That's the end of that story. The Romans. Pilate wasn't particularly interested in Jesus, but what he was interested in was the, the growing movement that he was leading because the Romans didn't like growing movements because growing movements often led to insurrections and insurrections had to be put down because it threatened the rule of the empire. And so when Pilate saw that Jesus was dead, the Romans said, well... We may not have thought he did anything wrong, but at the end of the day, we're glad he's gone because it ends that story. The adversary of, of Jesus, Satan himself, thought the story was over. Satan, who had attempted to overthrow the throne of the Father and had been 
cast down many, many millennia before in his rebellion and who had, who had tried his best to defeat humanity, God's creation, by causing them to sin in the garden. Satan, who had worked Jesus' entire life to throw him off path, to try to kill him before he ever emerged into a, 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 a early childhood and tried to tempt him before he moved into his time of ministry. And now he had fulfilled his schemes and his plans by motivating others to murder Jesus on the cross and he thought he had won Jesus was in the tomb he thought it was the end of the story but as you might imagine I am here today to tell you that the story did not end on the cross or in the tomb the story continued on because what Jesus did on the cross was necessary in the, the shedding of his blood so that our sins could be forgiven. But the story couldn't end there because if he didn't rise again, death would still have its grip and its hold on humanity. He would have been a good man who died an unjust death. But the resurrection proved that he was more than that. That his sinless blood was shed for humanity. And then when he rose again, it testified that he, in fact, was the Son of God. Amen. That he was, in fact, the Messiah. That he was the one who could defeat not only sin, but death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. This is why the story continued. This is what the Word of God tells us. That on that first resurrection Sunday, the followers of Jesus came to the tomb and they found something unexpected. Mark chapter 6 verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they would go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone that was very large had already been rolled away. And as they entered this tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right-hand side of the tomb, and they were alarmed. That's another word for afraid. <laughs> Verse 6, that angel said, don't be alarmed. You are here looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. You can come and look and see the place where they laid him. He is not here. He is alive, just like he said. On the way to the tomb, they were wondering about how in the world they were going to be able to roll away the stone. And when they got there, they found the stone was already rolled away and that Jesus was risen from the dead. That's why we rejoice today. That's why we celebrate today. That's why we come together today. Oh, you can call it Easter. You can call it Resurrection Sunday. You can call it uh, uh, La Dia Resurrección. You can do whatever you want. But it is, in fact, the day we celebrate that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The story didn't end in a, in a closed tomb. It continued through an open door. That was caused by a, a, a stone that was rolled away. When the followers of Jesus arrived at the tomb that morning, they didn't find the body. They found an empty tomb. The door that was supposed to seal, the end of Jesus' story was removed. And the, sto the, stone, the door stood open, revealing that life had triumphed over death. That's right. well, if you're a believer in Jesus, you... You accept that story. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you might wonder, is that true? You might have doubt in your heart. In fact, many people have. For millennia, people have tried to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if you can disprove the resurrection, you can disprove it all. The resurrection is the pivotal thing. Without the resurrection, we're, of all men, most miserable. 
But let me just help you with that a minute. While there are those that would tell you that the resurrection never happened, in fact, it did. While many times people have tried to disprove it, they have failed. There's the account of the scripture. There's the account of contemporary witnesses. There's the account of multiple appearances of Jesus following the resurrection. There's the account of the Jews trying to disprove it through this narrative that the, that the disciples somehow stole his body. There is also the account that the disciples, every one of them died except for John, died for the sake of Jesus and this story. If it was a lie, they certainly wouldn't have gone to their death over it. No, it in fact happened. Many years ago, there was an investigative reporter named Josh McDowell, who did everything in his power. He was an atheist, and he was set out to, to disprove the resurrection. He said, I can do it. I'm a great investigative reporter. I'm going to find out all of the evidence, and I'm going to disprove this thing once and for all. And so he dove into the matter, and he began to pull all of the stories and all of the theories and all of the different evidences. And, and as he, the deeper he got, the more doubt in, in, came into his heart. Not doubt about the resurrection, but doubt about his doubt about the resurrection. Amen. The deeper he went, the more convinced he became until finally he said, there is no other conclusion other than the fact that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. Amen. He wrote a book about it called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's many years old, but it's still a good read. If you have doubt in your heart, download it on Kindle and read it. It will help you to see this is not, in fact, some fable. This is not a myth. This is not some sort of spun-up religious idea. But this is a historical fact that Jesus Christ was born. He died on the cross. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. And he still lives today. Yeah. He is risen. It seems impossible, doesn't it? It seems impossible that Jesus could be risen from the dead. Well, that's what this, this rolled away sto stone, this empty tomb, and this open door witnesses to us. That we serve a God that is able to do the impossible. In fact, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said this, With God, all things are possible. Nothing impossible is impossible when God steps into that impossibility. God makes all things possible. And he made the resurrection possible. And on this resurrection Sunday, now 2,000 years after the actual event, I want to just share with you three things that I believe this empty tomb and this open door represent for you and for me. Because this rolled away stone that revealed an open door is, is revealing an open doorway to you and to me. And the first is that it reveals an open doorway to forgiveness. An open doorway to forgiveness. Read with me, if you would, from Romans chapter 3, verse 21. It says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets both testify. Verse 22, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That's what I talked to you about earlier when I talked about John 3, 16. He said, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Let me pause for just a moment and reflect a little bit on, on verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does it mean to sin? Sin is what we talk about as that barrier that is placed between humanity and God. Sin in the New Testament is the Greek word hemartia, which means to miss the mark. It means to miss the mark of God's perfections, to miss the mark of God's holiness, to miss the mark of God's righteousness. When we talk about sin, we're not talking about merely about uh, 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 having a bad intent. It's about living in a way that is in any way short of perfection. You see, God is holy. 
holy. What does that mean? It means he's lacking in no way. He is complete in every part. He has no shadow of turning or brokenness within him. There is not even a hint of evil or wickedness or dishonesty or unpure motive in the heart or the essence of God. He is holy. He is righteous. He is eternally good. Man on the other part, I've never had one of those days. I don't know about you. If, you're, if, you've, if you've had one of those days, then come talk to me after service. I've never had a day that was perfect. I've never had a moment in my life, really, that was perfect. Because every moment that I've had, I'm in it, and I'm imperfect. My wife's not here today to testify of it. Praise the Lord. But she would tell you I'm imperfect. I fall short all the time. And so do you. There's not one of us that have ever lived on the face of the earth except for one that has been perfect. Every man from the time of Adam down to now and every man that will live after us will be imperfect. Save for one who is Jesus Christ the righteous who is the only name under heaven by which a man can be saved. The Bible says why? Because he is perfect. Sin entered into mankind through the sin of Adam. And that meant that from the very beginning of life, you and I were marred by it, broken by it. At the essence of our being, we, we were incapable of escaping it. Now, even when I was just the most precious little baby, and I was beautiful. Hey, it's my story. I can tell it the way I want to tell it. But even when I was precious, I have been told, I don't know that I remember it, nor do I believe it, but I have been told that there were moments when I didn't act precious. There were moments that I got angry. There were moments that I grabbed after things and said, mine. There were moments when I got angry and lashed out at my brother. There were moments that I threw temper tantrums when I didn't get my way. Now that was not yesterday. That was many years ago. But that's illustrative of something, isn't it? It's illustrative of that even in the innocence of a child, there is something in the heart of man that, that is selfish at its core, self-centered at, it, at its core. It's what St. Augustine says is the evidence of the Adamic nature in the, in the heart of, of even little children. It's evidence that, that this brokenness that came through Adam still exists in us. It's what Romans chapter 3, 23 says. All, all, that's an exclusive term and an inclusive term. All have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is in verse 24. Because in verse 24 it says something to us. It says, and all, also the same term, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. What was he saying to us? He's saying, through Adam's sin came, but through Christ salvation and righteousness comes. And by faith in Jesus what happens is that my, I am, my sins become forgiven and washed away so that I can be seen as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So that when God the Father looks at me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the sacrifice of Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. I'm covered. I'm forgiven. All I have to do is believe. Believe in what? Believe that Jesus is who he said he is. And that he did what he said he would do. And that he continues to do it today for you and for me. This open door, this open door represents a doorway to forgiveness. A doorway to forgiveness for you and for me. Oh, God could never forgive me. I've done some bad things. We've all done some bad things. Outside of Christ, we're all capable of doing the worst things. But his forgiveness is for all. 
who will believe. That's the good news of Romans 3. Don't focus on Romans 3, 23. Just acknowledge that fact and then celebrate in Romans 3, 24. And receive the forgiveness that is available to you through faith in Jesus Christ because he opened the door 2,000 years ago so that you could pass through. Not only does he open the door to forgiveness, but he opens the door to freedom. You see, when we're forgiven of our sin, we're also given freedom from the control and the consequences of that sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 19, it says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and in its end, eternal life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, brothers and sisters, before we came to Christ, before we walked through the open door of forgiveness through faith in Jesus, we were under the control of sin and we had no hope of ever coming out from underneath its control. We had no hope of ever escaping its grip. We had no hope of escaping the consequences of our sin. Because Sin separates us from God. The earnings, the reward of sin is death. But the gift of God is life. The gift of God is eternal life. When we walk through the doorway of forgiveness, we walk through the doorway of freedom. That we are able to be free from the control of sin in our lives and we are free from the consequences of sin. No longer am I destined to be eternally separated from God in a place called hell. No, no, no. I am now destined to be in the eternal embrace of God in a place called heaven because I am free from both the control of sin and the consequences of sin. And when I'm free from the control of sin and the consequences of sin, I'm also free to become who God called me to be. You see, God didn't create you to be a sinner. He created you to be a follower of him. He didn't create you to be separated from him. He called you to be close to him. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. And then jump on over to Ephesians chapter 2, when the apostle Paul tells us in verse 1, As for you, you were once dead in your transgressions and sins. In fact, outside of Christ, even though we are alive physically, we're dead spiritually. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, that's another word, isn't it? All of us used to live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's all the bad news. That's the bad news. That's who we used to be. That's who you are if you are outside of Christ, but that's who you used to be if you were in Christ. Now, here's the good news in verse 4. But because of God's great love for us, He who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you are saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ. Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus verse 8 catch this Ephesians 2 verse 8 underline this the Bible highlight it in your app for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God not by works that so that anyone could boast for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. What in the world does that say? It says that I was once separated from God even though I looked like I was alive. I was dead on the inside. I was separated and on my way to eternal separation from God. But somewhere God got a hold of me and saved me. He, He brought me through the doorway of forgiveness. He brought me into the doorway of freedom. I became no longer a slave to sin. No longer destined for the consequences of sin. But now I became free 
free to be who it was that God wanted to be. And who am I? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells me, I am God's handiwork. I am His masterpiece. I am His workmanship. God didn't call you, didn't create you to be an orphan. He created you to be His son. He created you to be His daughter. He didn't create humanity to be separated from Him. He created humanity to be united with Him and to walk in relationship with Him. You don't have to be separated from God. God calls you to be united with Him. You were created to be loved by God. Not to be judged by Him, but be loved by Him. To be nurtured by Him, not punished by Him. Don't think that God's up there waiting just to get, get even with you. He's just waiting to see how he can bring judgment or discipline down on your head. No, no, no. He's up there saying, would you please just come to me? All of you who are weary and heavy laden, every one of you that are struggling with your sin, every one of you that are feeling the weight of this, of this world and the worry and the anxiety and the fear and all the brokenness, all of you that are walking through this world darkly and find, stumbling around trying to find your way, just come to me and let me give you my burden. Let me give you my help. Let me show you my life. Let me love you. God's not trying to separate you from him. He's trying to draw you to him. You were created to be loved by God. And you were created with a purpose. What's your purpose in this life? Somebody said, what is my purpose in life? I'll tell you what it is. It's to know God and to make him known to others. That's your purpose in life. To know him. To know who he is. To to gaze upon his beauty, to, to feel his embrace, and to, to know how wonderful he is. And then to let the other people know about that goodness and that grace. You were created with a purpose. You were created with a destiny. God, when you were conceived in your mother's womb, and it didn't matter how that happened, when, when life came into you, he created you. He created you with a divine destiny, a preferred pathway that he had for your life. He has a destiny for you. Now, it gets up to you whether you follow it or not. It's up to you whether you cooperate with God and see it come to pass in your life. But make no mistake about it, God has one for you. He has one for you here that he prefers, and he has one for you on the other side of this life that he prefers. He wants you to live your life to the fullest, and he wants you to expand and fulfill all of your capacities here on this earth. But after this life, he wants you to live with him for all eternity. That's the destiny that he has for you. That's what he wants for you. You are his masterpiece. This word handiwork that I read, this word workmanship, it's the Greek word poema. It's the word that we get the English word poem out of. It has the inference of a work of art, something that's given careful attention to and crafted to express a particular purpose or a particular idea of the artist. Well, that's exactly what you are. Thank you. you are God's poem to the world. You're a letter he's writing to everyone around. You are his work of art that he wants everyone to see. Amen. You have been created to do things that no one else can do, that no one else can do. You have individual things that he has prepared for you to accomplish in this life. You get to decide whether or not you do them or not. But he wants you to. He desires for you to. He created you to do that. The doorway of the empty tomb is a doorway to freedom. Freedom from the bondage of sin, the consequences of sin, and the freedom to become who God called you to be. This is also an open door to the future. Open door to a future that you can't even begin to conceive of. The Bible says, eye has not seen or ear has not heard or has even entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. What does that mean? That means outside of Christ, 
you can't conceive of what he has prepared for you. Outside of Christ, you can't, it hasn't even begun to dawn on your mind. But through the open doorway of an empty tomb is a life of forgiveness, a life of freedom, and a life that has a future that is better than you can imagine. A future with him. A future in heaven. John chapter 10, verse 7 says, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I'm the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come. I have come, Jesus says, that they might have life and that it may have it more abundantly. The doorway to the open tomb is a doorway to Jesus. And he is the doorway to an eternity with him. The enemy, the imposters, the false religions, the self-oriented help that gives fleeting peace, all of that part of the thief's plan to steal, to kill, and destroy. Maybe your life, you've had some things stolen from you. Maybe your peace has been stolen. Maybe your joy has been stolen. Maybe your innocence has been stolen. Maybe your hope has been stolen. Maybe your, your dreams have been killed. Maybe, maybe they've been dashed upon the hard rocks of life. Maybe it feels as though your, your future's destroyed. Well, I've got good news for you. There's an open door where there's a Savior who offers forgiveness, freedom, and a future that is full of Him, His life, His love, and His restoration. This is what Jesus came to bring us. This is what He came to bring us. I, I've got all kinds of questions. It seems impossible. This is, this is something that doesn't seem quite real. Well, that's the way the disciples felt in the hours following Jesus' death. They'd seen their Savior, their Messiah, murdered. Can you imagine the disappointment and disillusionment that was going on in their brain and their mind? Can you imagine what was happening here? No, no. They were in the midst of something that totally contorted their mind. The disciples were saying, how could this have happened? And Jesus was Messiah, now he's dead. This is impossible. The women on the way to the tomb that first Easter morning, that first resurrection day, they, they were wondering, how in the world are we going to do this? And we've got what we need for the, but who's going to roll away the stone and What's going to happen? It's impossible for us to do it by ourselves. But with every impossible thought, they soon found that God had already gone ahead of them and made what was impossible possible. They found that God had already done what was necessary to make a way for them in the midst of their situation. That's what you'll find when you come to Jesus. It may seem impossible to you now, but if you'll dare to believe, and step out in faith, you'll find that he has already made a way. He's already answered the questions. He's already provided a means by which you can traverse the impossibility that's imagined in your mind right now. Timothy Keller, who's now gone on to be with the Lord, who's a great writer, minister, he said this. He said, the reason the stone was rolled away on Jesus' tomb was not so that Jesus could get out, but so that we could get in. You think a stone 
could get in the way of Jesus coming out? He didn't need to roll away a stone. He created the whole earth with the power of his word. The stone was rolled away so that we could get in and pass through the open door to awareness that he is alive. That he lives and that he saves and that he helps. This is why the stone was rolled away. And he invites you to come. He invites you to come. He invites you to walk through the door of forgiveness, the door of freedom, and the door of, of your future. If you'll do that, here's what I know will happen. The Lord will save you, and he'll help you. Oh, does that mean that your life's going to be easy? No. Does it mean you won't go through difficulty? No. It doesn't mean that you won't ever have questions. What it means is that you'll have a God who is with you and will never leave you nor forsake you. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. His name is a strong tower in whom the righteous run and find safety in the midst of chaos. He is the eternal word of the living God who gives you the truth in the midst of your confusion. He's the one who walks upon the water and says, peace be still, and causes the storms of life to begin to recede. He's the one who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what you could ever ask or imagine in your life. Oh, what's my promise? My promise is if you walk through the open door, you'll find a living Savior who will change your life forever. And it says, set your destiny forever in heaven with him. So every Easter that I've had the opportunity to preach, I've shared the gospel message as best as I know how. Sometimes it's better than others. But the gospel message is this. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. God loved you enough to send you one. He died for you. He rose again for you. And if you believe in Him, you'll be forgiven of your sin and you'll be made right with God. Now that's pretty simple. Walk through the door to a new life. Walk through a new door. Would you bow your heads with me today? So now's the moment of decision. I've preached this message. I'm confident the Lord has communicated His truth. And you've heard it. Now you have an opportunity to decide what you're going to do with it. Will you walk through the door or will you stand outside? And I want to ask you today, if you're someone who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ and needs to know Him today, you need to be forgiven for your sins. I'm going to ask you to walk through the door of faith in just a moment. If you're somebody who perhaps used to follow the Lord and you've walked away from the Lord and you feel like you need to recommit your life to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to walk through that door as well and recommit your life to the Lord. So if you're here today and you'd say, that's me, I'm, I need to accept Christ for the first time or I need to rededicate my life to Christ. We're going to pray a prayer in a moment. I'm not going to embarrass you. I won't single you out, but I want to pray for you. And if that's you, would you just lift your hand so I know who you are today so I can pray with you? Is there anybody here today who say, that's me, Pastor? That's me. That's me. Yes. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's no reason to be ashamed. We've all been here at one time or another. We've all walked the aisle, raised a hand, prayed a prayer. Every one of us have done it. Is there anybody else today? Yes. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else today? I need to accept Christ into my life today. I need to re rededicate my life to Christ today. Anybody else? Yes. Amen. Amen. You can place your hands down after you've raised them. Anybody else today? Wait just a moment longer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Okay, you can place your hands down. We're here in just a moment. We're going to pray a prayer together. All of us in the house are going to pray this prayer. Prayer is not a magic formula, but it is a means by which you communicate your faith and you, your, your request to the Lord. We pray this prayer. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. So that's where we're going to pray the prayer. We're going to ask God to forgive us of our sins, and we're going to confess we believe in Him. When we do that, Jesus is faithful to respond to our, our faith and will forgive us of our sins. So if you raise your hand, or even if you didn't, if you'll pray this prayer, and if you're online, pray this prayer right now with us. The Lord's going to help you. He's going to save your soul. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, let's say it together. Lord Jesus, I confess today my need of you. I have sinned, and I need forgiveness. And you're the only one that can give it to me. I believe today that you're the Son of God, that you died for my sins, and that you rose again. And I ask you, Lord, to come into my life, to be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins and fill my life with your Spirit and help me to live for you from this day forward. I ask for your help, Lord, in every area of my life. Help me to walk in your truth, in your ways, the rest of my life. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Just keep your head bowed if you would. If you prayed that prayer, at the conclusion of our service, our prayer partners are going to be around this altar. I want to encourage you to come forward. Let them pray with you. They'd like to give you a Bible and help you on your next steps. Others of you here today have sensed God speaking to you through this message in some way. Maybe you've been reminded of some truths, or maybe the Holy Spirit is drawing you to have a greater sense of freedom in your life, or a greater sense of purpose in your life, or a greater sense of promise of your future. I'm going to pray for all of us here today, but however the Lord is, is calling you to respond, as I pray for you, I want you to just offer that to the Lord in prayer. And I believe the Lord will meet you right where you are. So all across this place, if we would just stand to our feet for just a moment, let's, let's pray together and then we'll be dismissed in just a moment. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this wonderful time of celebration. I thank you, God, for the joy of worship. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the challenge that it gives us and the encouragement as well. Now, Lord, by your spirit, you've drawn us close to you. And now I pray that in whatever way you're moving in the hearts and the lives of these that are here, I pray, God, that you would minister to them. Lord, if there, there are those that are still on the outside of faith, I pray that you would just help them to take one step closer to you today. There are those of us who have been in the faith, God, that we need to draw closer to you. Help us to take one step closer to you today. That we might know you better. That we might experience more of your freedom and more of the reality of our calling and our purpose and your desired future for us. I pray your blessing upon these families, these individuals that are here today, that your hand would be upon them all as they go forth for the rest of this day. We ask it in Jesus' name today. Amen. 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 If you're thankful for the risen Savior, give him a hand today. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Let me, let me say a couple of things to you before we're dismissed. The first of which is thank you so much for coming here this morning. So glad that you're here. If you're here for the first time, let me just remind you, we'll be here back next Sunday. And we'll be here at 10 a.m., not, not at 9 or 11. Just we have one service regular at 10 o'clock. So we hope to see you then. And if, if you're interested, I'm going to be starting a two-week message series next week on the topic of happiness. How many of you like to be happy in your life? Right? How many, I could use some more happiness in my life. How about you? So the next two weeks, I'm going to be talking about the topic of happiness. So I'm going to encourage you to come and be a part of that. We'll be back here on Wednesday night for our first Wednesday at 6.30, Saturday morning for prayer at 9. We love and appreciate you all so very much. Don't forget, we've got a photo opportunity for you as you leave today. Get your Easter family photo. And, you know, your mama always likes you to get a picture on Easter. 
So don't run around. Get your picture with your mama. We, we want you to do that. Be nice to one another as you do that today. Amen? Amen. Let's say our benediction and, and, and be blessed today as we go. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, Lord, I pray your blessings upon each of these that are here. I bless them in their going with life and peace and prosperity in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Easter. Thank you.